Hi, everybody. I am just going to give everyone a moment there to be able to join us. I see that lots of people there are coming in and you're all super welcome. So just giving you a moment there to be able to join us. OK, so uh, first and foremost, hello, everyone. You're all very welcome. My name is Susan Hayes Cullerton and I am the co-author of Positive Economics. I am going to lead you through a session tonight where we're going to focus on a case study of supply and demand, particularly by looking at the CAO system in Ireland and how that works. Take this off the bat here for the office. So specifically, I'm going to take you through the latest data from the CAO, which is the Central Applications Office. And I'm going to show you exactly how the demand function applies exactly to each and every single person who applies through the CAO for a course in either a technological university or a third level institution. Um, there's a range of them across the country, so I'm going to talk you through all of that. OK, so I think everybody is here now. So just before we get started, I want to point out that number one, this session is being recorded and those who are registered will get the recording. Uh, number two, any of you that have agreed to be on the mailing list, you will be sent an email about the next one. And also, if you would like to send in any questions, the chat is open and the Q&A is open. But in particular as well, I also have got an Instagram story running. I'm just going to give you the link for that. So that then if you want to send in that now, of course, as you know, an Instagram story will only be running for 24 hours. So if there are any questions, you can send it in through that. If there's anything after that, of course, you can DM me. So I'm just going to pop this here uh, for everyone. There you go. OK, so that's, that is my Instagram. If any of you are on a different device and you can't click on that link, my Instagram is simply my name. So it's at Susan Hayes Cullerton. So I have a sticker there where I just have, if you have any questions, pop them in to me. OK, so I'm just going to start off by explaining what the CAO is. Then I'm going to talk to you uh, very briefly about supply. I'm going to spend most of my time on demand. But also what this will give you is a dual purpose which is that if you want to understand more about how the CAO works, which many of you may well want, then it will also serve that purpose there as well. I can see my Instagram there now is dinging. So uh, I will, I'll take a look at that there afterwards if there are any questions, as I say. Right, what is the CAO? So it's Central Applications Office. And in essence, the way the CAO works is that I, and by the way, when I talk about I, me as a student, which I was back when I was studying my own leaving cert, me as a student that I apply through a number, okay, so it's not my name, it's not my address, it's nothing like that. Through a number, I apply into the Central Applications Office with a view to applying for either a Level 8 or a Level 7-6 course. Level 8 is a degree, so it's your typical, whether it's BES in Trinity, whether it is Mathematical Sciences in UCC, whether it's Sports Science in University of Limerick, etc. They're all your Level 8 courses so that is a degree level seven six on the other hand what they are is your typical diploma and certificate courses so you may for example be applying for those if you're in my office by the way is in tu dublin that's where i am right now my office is on the campus of that before that my office for 11 years was in dcu my brother went to mtu um munster technological university personally myself i went to nui galway so it level seven six is certificate and diploma, and then level eight is a degree. Now, as any student can, what you can do is you can apply to the CEO for up to 10 level eight courses and 10 level seven six courses, right? So that's the basics of how it works from the point of view of you going through the process. Then what happens is now bear in mind you're a number, okay? So nobody knows your name or your address or anything, it is a number. That you, well, when you apply, you put in those details. But the point is, is that it's taking a number and it is then going to be comparing against a range of courses. What they use in order to determine your eligibility for courses typically comes down to points. And the points come from your Leaving Cert exams. Now, of course, there are other conditions in some cases. For example, in HPAT, uh, in, sorry, in medicine, you have to do a HPAT exam. In some cases, 
There might also be minimum requirements for certain courses. I'll give you a website where you can check out all of this. And also in some cases, there, the course may be, there can be so much demand for the course that even the points won't, won't get you there. But broadly speaking, for the vast majority of the case, what we what the CAO A does, CAO does is that it takes the number of people who apply for the CAO and it compares it to the number of courses available. Typical supply and demand, except in this case, instead of paying for your course, you don't pay with money, you pay with points. The points you can get through your leaving cert exams. So that's the that's the simple market mechanism that, that takes place. What I'm going to show you is what influences that. I'm going to show you exactly how the demand function works, but I'm going to start off by showing you supply. Okay, so, uh, right, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share my screen and also along the way, you're going to get some extra benefits here. Number one, I'm going to show you how to analyze data quickly. I'm going to show you how to get insights on the CAO process. And also I'm going to give you, going to show you all of the, the latest thinking around where the fastest growing jobs are as well. So they're all the extra benefits that you get as well from being here. So what I'm going to do here now is I am going to share my screen and I'm going to start off here by doing that. By the way, I have a couple of articles in here as well that are out in the past couple of days. It's very, very recent that I have what I have here for you. Okay, so I'm going to start off here. Okay, so this is my supply and demand case study. And first of all, let's start off with that. So here is where I'm going to, to pick up on the overall statistics that are the supply, right? So when we look at the supply of courses in Ireland, so put this in here as, um, as just a nod to the type of thing that people are applying for. So this is somebody who is who went through university and then, as you can see, went on then to have a PhD. PhD is level eight, sorry, level 10. It is the highest level of education in Ireland and in lots of other parts around the world. But overall, the statistics here that I got from the CAO are these, is that the number of offers that were made available in the very first round of the CAO, it can go up to five offers. The, ver the actual number of places available in the Irish education system um, in total is uh, 58, sorry, 57,000. That is the number of applicants that will receive an offer in round one is 57,296. So that was the total amount of supply that was provided last year. Now, as you can see here, level eight to total round one offers were 51,000 and there was also level seven, six, which were 34,000. So in one person can be made two offers, right? You can be offered your level seven, six and your level eight. So that's where, when it comes to 57,296, offers were made available in uh, that were the number of applicants who actually received an offer some of those people as you can tell got two now look over here did the, the supply of places available grew over those those years so you can see there was 55,000 students got offered a place in 2021 and that grew up to 57,296 now I have got the data back to back for decades and I can show you how the growth of that has been over time but as you can see where how this happens is that number one, our universities grow and the number of them grow like TU Dublin. Um, some of you who might be here tonight might remember this as the old DIT. Some of you who are here tonight might remember that MTU, um, Munster Technological University, used to be CIT. In fact, some of you may remember when it was RTC as well. Uh, and also when I, by the way, university, National University of Ireland in Galway is no longer called that. I should actually correct myself there as well. So the point is, is that universities grow, they can offer more places and also the, the capacity. Uh, definitely when I was in college in Galway, like the, the growth, the, the physical growth of the university was significant over my four year degree when I did financial maths and economics. So that is part of the reason that this happens is the number of universities grow and all of the other things that happen in the supply function, but I'm gonna focus on demand particularly tonight. So in essence, as you can see here, um, the number of places that are on offer in round one grow. Just, I just think that it's important to uh, mention something here. And that is, I, I find this, this really interesting is that 82%, right? 82% of people, that's four in five, right? Four in five people, in 2022, who put a level eight course on their CAO application, 
four out of five people got one of their top three choices. And I think that's a really important point because a lot of people, of course, are very concerned about the CAO and will I get an offer and will I get an offer of something that I like? But just remember, four out of five people last year in 2022 got one of their top three preferences, and that was of level eight. And the number the last year was slightly lower. The percentage last year was slightly lower at 79 percent. The, particularly the reason in between the two is because, of course, as you can see here, the number of places actually grew as well. Now, and I think this number is also very interesting, is when you go down to level 7-6, so 9 out of 10 people got their first preference of a level 7-6 course. 9 out of 10 people. And 98%, 98 out of 100 people got an offer, which was one of their top three preferences as well. So, of course, really good career advice is to make sure that you apply for the CAO in order of your actual preference, in order of the, the what you actually want to apply for. Because as you can see, the likelihood is, and of course it depends on a lot of things, but the likelihood is that you will get one of your top three if it is four out of five people at level eight. And in the case of level seven, six, 98% of people. Okay, so anyway, that's the supply. This is the actual number of offers that are made available to people. And of course, this is only round one. Then there could be round two, three, four, and, and five as well. Okay, now let's look at the demand function though. So the demand function, I took this picture straight out of Positive Economics, our book. And the demand function, it means that demand is influenced by the price. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about the price um, of, of things. I'm actually going to talk to you about literal price, the price of other goods. So in this context, I'm going to show you about preferences, about the changing nature of what people are applying for. Not the points, just actually the actual amount of people that are applying for these courses. That's how I'm going to show you how to analyze data. In a quick way, I'm going to show you a couple of tricks on Excel there as well. I'm also going to show you about the income of the consumer. What I'm going to talk to you about there is in the context of leaving cert points. How are they changing? So what are the trends as regards uh, leaving cert points? Are, what, are points going up or are they going down, broadly speaking? I'll show you that. Uh, consumer expectation, I'm going to show you. I found some data on the fastest growing jobs um, that we can expect in Ireland. Um, now, consumer tastes or preferences, in essence, this is kind of baked in here to consumer expectations, right? So I'm, I'm not going to delve into that, but I'm, and unplanned factors, I'll touch on those. But I'm also going to talk to you about government regulations. I want to particularly mention something to you there. So when we look at what people are applying for in terms of points, these are the things that underpin demand. So this is a piece, um, the next, what I'm going to show you, the next uh, slide is showing you a piece from the Irish Times three days ago, okay? And this is it. So on the 17th of February, which was last uh, Friday, um, it says here, traditional universities have lost out to newly created technological universities in overall CAO applications this year, according to the latest data shared in the higher education sector. The trend has sparked concern in some traditional university circles where academics believe the decline is linked to factors like higher rents, travel costs and greater competition from technological universities. Overall, college applications for traditional universities are on average down by five to six percent and up by an equivalent proportion for technological universities, according to informed sources. So what, are the, what do they mean? OK, you can, of course, apply to go to college in Galway, uh, let's say uh, University of Galway, uh, UCC and um, let's say Trinity, UCD, etc. Obviously, everyone that I'm referring to there are all in a city. And as a result, then, and UL, of course, um, in each of those cases, of they all have their own housing crisis, there can be costs of travel and so on. The technological universities then have other opportunities, for example, ATU, Atlantic Te Technological University, that is a place, th th that university then is, is across various different campuses. One of them is in Mayo, for example. So that is what they're talking about here is the actual costs of going to college are not just the fees in question, but the actual living costs as well. So that's why it's saying here that demand for, for traditional universities are down by about five to 6%. Now, I will tell you where that data is coming from. This is a press release. It came out on the 1st of February. Now, to those of you who are familiar with the date, the 1st of February, the 1st of February is a, um, the 1st of February is the date that the CAO applications must be in, in order to get the early 
price. Okay, so uh, that is the normal application deadline, as you can see over here. And uh, the application figure was 78,184 CAO applications have been made. That's the number of applications that have been applied. Now, they can be received from people like you who are, let's say, doing your leaving cert. It can be a, it can also be where you have people who are repeating their leaving cert. You can also have this from maybe a variety of other people as well. So there, you'll see the number of people that actually do their leaving cert every year as well. I'll show you that too. But the point is that thus far, 78,184 applicants um, were what have been applied. And as you can see, um, a change of course facility will become available from Friday the 3rd for all registered applicants. The facility can be used by mature applicants to add course choices and for applicants who have forgotten to include a restricted course, but the fee of 10 euro applies. And then there's also the free change of mind facility. So anybody who's applied by now uh, can also use the free change of mind uh, facility. Um, and that opens on the 5th of May and it closes at the 1st of July, which of course is after the leaving cert. Okay, so then as you can see the one there. But this is where the data is actually coming from. This is the press release, but the data behind that will actually show where people are applying to go to, what courses, etc. So I just want to start off by saying the actual price of the cost of living is in the first place. That is influential um, before we start. Now, the next thing, of course, is what people often talk about. And I'm talking about here the price of all the goods. So competition. What I'm going to show you now is how people have changed their mind about courses over the years right so i'm just going to take you through a piece of data here so i'm going to pull up um is this the one i want yes it is okay so what i've taken what i have here is level eight courses right and i'm going to show you there's a lot of data here right a lot of information here obviously we only have a short period of time to go through all of this so i'm going to show you how to analyze this pretty quickly and to find out what really matters these are all of level eights Okay, these are all of level eights, as you can see here. These are all level eights. These are all the degrees. I'm also going to show you level seven, six, level seven, six. But what you can see here, this is the demand. This is the mentions and the first preferences. Okay, these are what people want. On table number four and table number five, instead, these are the offers. So this is the supply, the offers and the first preferences offers. So all I'm going to look for, so I told you I would, I'm going to look at the demand. The demand is the mentions and the first preferences, okay? So in 2022, this is the um, this is how many people mentioned, for example, the education field, and first preferences were 5,441. Now, while all that is very interesting, of course, what we as economists want to know is, well, how has that changed? So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take a look at the percentage change. I'm going to look at how demand has changed over this period of time. It's going to highlight this. I'm going to make this purple. I like purple. That's a bit too purple now, though, isn't it? Okay, let me make this uh, this color. Okay, right. Now, again, I don't have time to go through all of these and to pick out what ones are really important. So here's what I'm going to do. Um, first of all, okay, I am going to hide these columns, right? Because that information is interesting, but it's all summarized for me over here. The second thing that I'm going to do is I am going to code in, right, super, super quick now. I am going to code in and if then loop, what I want to do is that I want to pick out very quickly, I want the data to auto generate for me what I'm actually looking for. So any of you who are doing your economics projects and you're wondering how to look at data quickly, here is the way in which I'm going to show you how to do it. And while I'm doing it, I'm going to show you the actual changes in demand in courses in Ireland today. All right. So what I want to do here is I would like to see the mentions, right? So for level eight courses that are actually in here, what I'd like to see are the mentions significant increase, right? So I want to see what courses have got significantly more demand. Significant. This is 2022, of course. Okay. And this is according to by the 22nd of July. Tw uh, significant increase. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make this very simple for myself. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say equals if, right? So this creates a code for me. And it's a very simple code. So I'm going to say if the group, if this is higher, is greater than 10%, then tell me significant, significant, significant increase. So this is what we call an if then loop. If not, then put not significant, significant, significant. 
Okay. So the, if any of you want to know how to code an if then loop, you can check out lots and lots and lots of YouTube um, explanations of it. But it's simply if, and then brackets, you put in your function. In my case, I want to know if this number is greater than 10%, then call it significant increase. If it's not, call it not significant. Okay. So as you can see here, because education has grown by 3%, that's not significant. I picked the 10%, by the way, just a round number. I'm going to pull this down and now look what happens. It now tells me exactly where the mentions are significantly increased. But of course, I still would have to go through all this to figure it out myself. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to put in here a filter and I only want to see where have we got a significant increase. There we go. All right. So, haha, here we are. So the most significant increase is interdisciplinary programs and qualifications, including arts and humanities. Now, so that interdisciplinary means the interaction between different um, disciplines. So maybe art and science or um, science and humanities or um, anyway, I won't go any further from there. Does that surprise me? No, because more and more employers are looking for people who, have, who can think with both right side and left side of their brain or scientists who have an, a grounding in, in accounting, for example. So that we can see here, that's a significant increase. But what I'm also interested to see is maybe that number is actually coming off a very low base. Now, if I unhide my cells, then I will be able to see that, okay? So if I unhide my cells, okay, or unhide my cells, then I'll be able to see what, ah, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, look at that, okay? Look at that. Here's where we're seeing that in, the numbers are going from like 296 up to 453, right? So so I was right. I, I did think, all right, that there was a possibility there that they might be very low base. So when you're looking at data, it's important. I'm going to hide these again. It's important that if you see a very big number like that, check what's actually coming off. Let's look at the other ones. Arts, humanities, languages, interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, the environment, you're going to hear me talk about that later on based on another piece of data I found. 23% IT, no surprise there, uh, growth by 12% manufacturing and processing, again, particularly with the growth of STEM jobs, no surprise there, architecture and construction, with a lot of the money and a lot of the emphasis now putting on the housing and construction crisis, again, we can see why that might be, again, interdisciplinary programs, focusing on agriculture, forestry and veterinary, and then secondary education, right, so we can see here, there's been a very, very significant increase in those, but there are mentions, now what I want to do is I'm going to switch that off, right? I'm going to switch that off. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same, but let me do the same for first preferences because first preferences are, of course, they're going to be what people really, really want, okay? So I'm now going to change my code. Oh, it's already done it for me. It's already, yeah, all I want to look at is here. So what I want to see is where has there been a really big change in the first preference votes? Sorry. First preference vote sounds like an election. First preferences, uh, when it comes to that, where is where have been the big significant increases? So I'm going to put on a filter here and let me just check significant increase. There we go. And here we are. So humanities in, increase interdisciplinary again with arts and humanities, environment, architecture. This is the only one. This is a very interesting finding, in my opinion. So we've seen dentistry grown by 5% overall, but 10% of first preferences. Now that's that's an interesting point. And generally when I talk to people who want to study for dentistry, they really, really want to study dentistry. Um, it's not something like, oh, I go for dentistry or business, you know, whereas people might say business and accounting. So you can see that finding coming through there, okay? So overall, we can see that there's been significant increases in humanities, and you can see all of the ones there. Environment, architecture and construction, interesting that there's not as many references for example here to education or to secondary education so let's now apply that and let's go over to level seven six mention some first preferences again right so this i'm going to do this again really quickly so first thing i'm going to do is i'm going to hide all this i just want to be able to do what i'm doing here well and i'm just going to color this up as well for crack okay let's yeah let's do the same color so i'm going to say mention significant significant increase oh you know what i didn't do is a significant decrease i need to do that as well significant uh increase okay so i'm going to do the same thing again here equals if and in this case i'm going to take an if loop and i'm going to check if this is greater than 10 percent then call it um significant increase 
If it's not, then we can do significant, uh, not significant, okay, just not significant. Okay, and I'd close my if-then loop and it doesn't understand what I'm asking it to do. Oh yeah, that's because I've typed in a, a question mark instead of greater than. All right, there we go. So I'm just gonna pull this down all the way here. Here we go. Mm. Very few, isn't there? Very few. Okay, let's run the filter. Okay, and now let's go here to significant increase. Yeah, so uh, certainly fewer, and I think this one is very interesting. Look here, is that in the case of hygiene, the overall maintenance has gone up by 11%, but actually the number of first preferences has gone down by 6%. Okay, in addition here, we've got arts, 158% journalism and information. Um, that, yeah, I mean, look, I can I can deduce I can deduce several opinions from that too, but I'll keep my opinions to myself. I let the data do the talking. Physical sciences, again, architecture and construction, veterinary and uh, hygiene and occupational health services. Okay, I'm going to then take off that filter, select all. Okay, and let me now run the same across over here. And let's see, as regards the first preferences, what in particular is catching people's interest. So significant increase is arts, uh, humanities, except languages, journalism and information, physical sciences and architecture and construction. So isn't it clear here what people are, are interested in is construction is coming up across the board, arts and humanities across the board, IT at level eight, journalism and information at level seven, six. Um, also education in terms of mentions, but specifically education, sec secondary education, education in terms of mentions. However, dentistry is particularly a grow of growing interest at level eight from the first preference po point of view. OK, so what is what's what's decreasing? Because, of course, the demand function moves both right and left. So what is what is decreasing? What are people not interested in? OK, so I'm going to run this across here. And I'm simply going to, okay, of course it won't work like that. So I'm just going to take off my filter. Okay, select all here, okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy and paste this. But this time, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to change this to, if it is less, okay. Now I need to make sure. So what I want to do is I want to check if H6, is less than minus 10%. H6 is less than minus 10%. And I'm going to change this, of course, to significant D increase. And my work, oh, doesn't understand what I'm asking to do. Let's go back. If H, oh yeah, H6, I need to put in the full cell. H6, all right, there we go. Now let's run this the whole way. So what has had a significant decrease? And I'm just going to change this so that I know exactly what I'm doing here. What has had a significant decrease? Uh, this time, I'm going to sort and filter, and my filter here, what the my significant decrease, what is less of interest to people? Agriculture, health, well, health would have gone through a big demand surge when it came to COVID. Uh, health here is both, as you can see here, across the board. I won't do the first preferences. You can see yours for yourself. Nursing and midwifery and physiotherapy. So three out of four of the ones in decline in, in lowering interest in health. All are all, sorry, three of the four of decline in interest when it comes to demand for course points or level A courses all refer to health. And one of them then is agriculture. I'm just going to then very, very quickly pop across over here and do the same. So when it comes to this, I'm gonna go over here to that. Let me tell the data what I wanted to do. I want to look at significant decrease. Okay, and down here then, what I want to see is that if H6, H6 is less than minus 10%, I want you to tell me if it's a significant decrease. Okay, right, and let's run the data here. Where is our significant decreases coming from? Uh, I need to filter. Sometimes it forgets that I already had a filter on. That's why I need to do it twice. Go filter. And now let's just see where we get our significant decrease. Only two. Manufacturing and processing. Hmm. And transport services. 
manufacturing and processing and transport services. Now, with the with the dawn of uh, of self driving cars, I can see how that would be the case. But manufacturing and processing, I didn't expect that. So let me just turn off this filter because didn't we mention significant increases here in that area? So again, I just need to put it back on. Did we not? Significant increase. OK. All right. So as you can see here, obviously, the significant increases here uh, refer to, to differences over uh, over there. Yeah. Yeah. OK. All right. So as you can see here, I'm going to take off the filter. That's the way in which we can analyze data and we can understand that is also how demand and supply is happening. So when it comes to the price of other goods, uh, what I want to bring in, in here as well is that we can also see, oh, points in courses in health are now, or the applications for health fell in 2022, then therefore I may be, uh, if I'm kind of a bit worried that I wouldn't be able to make the points last year, well, maybe with that decline, then the points might, might be lower this year, etc. Okay, right, let's go on to the next one. Now, the income of the consumer. So when we talk about the income, this time I want to talk about particularly the points itself. And lots of you, of course, would have heard of, of dramatic point inflation over the past couple of years. And as a result, I wanted to show you exactly what the figures were here. So in 2022, there was 1.9% of uh, students who actually took the Leaving Cert. Now, bear in mind, I just want to point that out, is that you had 58,056 students. Um, so of that number, you can see here the points, 1.9% uh, of people scored 1 to uh, 65. 600 points plus was 3.6%. So you can see the cumulative total. That means that 5.5% of students who took the Leaving Cert in 2022, uh, they got over 600 points, Whether and 1.9% of them got 65. If we go on here, there are 500 plus. Actually, a quarter, one in four students got 500 plus. How do I know that? Is because 25.1% of people got that. 51% of people get over 400. So one in two students who did the Leaving Cert got over, um, got over uh, 400. Three in four students here got over 300 points. Uh, almost nine out of 10 students got over 200 points. And then you had 7% um, of students who got a, between 100 and 199, which means that um, 90, well, 96.7% of people got over 100 points. And then you had 3.3% of people who got less than 100. And then that makes the total, right? Okay. Now you might say, okay, but how does that compare to previous years? Well, let me show you. Because where I got this from, what I need to do now is just go back. Where I got this from is here. I'm going to go back one step. Is that these are the points. Okay. So I can see on any given year, I can see what they were. So let me go back to 2019. And let's just see point inflation now there you go is that at the point at the time uh the number of percentage of candidates scoring was 0.4 percent so as you can see significantly lower and the candidates who scored from 600 to 624 were uh 1.4 percent sorry in total the people who got 600 plus was 1.4 percent and again i could go way down so in the last case i showed you 50 percent 51 percent one in two students got over 400 in 2019, that would have only been one in three. Uh, similarly, then I could I could go down go down through the numbers there, and I can show you. So this is the grade inflation. We can see this that there a grade inflation did happen. Now that's that's well known. I mean, I'm, what I'm talking to you there is nothing new. But as you can see, as people have more points, well then they can spend more on the various courses. Now, if I was to show you 2021 versus 2020, and I could show you all those things, and then there was predicted grades and all sorts of things, of course, change things. But this, of course, naturally affects things. And I remember giving the webinar in 2020, um, when, of course, we were all in lockdown. And also, that was the first year of the new syllabus. And there was the project, and there was all sorts of things going on as well at the time. And... Then I remember like so many people being delighted with their exam results and they deserve to be and then going on to see, OK, but now the points have rocketed up for the course that I was applying for. And that's because if ultimately your population has more money, then the price of goods naturally happen. That's how inflation, that's how uh, demand pull inflation happens. If your your audience, your population, your market has more money, well, then, of course, the price that they can afford to pay increases. On the other hand, if it goes the other way, then it goes the other way. 
So in this case, the income, right, the amount of money that our audience has is not actual coins or notes or bank balances. Instead, it's points. And so therefore, you can see the impact of that. OK, um, I did I want to go and show? Yes. No, I did. No, no, I've shown you that. I wanted just to remember to show you the press release of the number of people who applied in the first place. OK, so moving on then from there, I just want to show you this one. Right. So also people uh, make decisions based on consumer expectations of the price rise of the future. So where I want to go on this is that lots and lots of teenagers who work with me um, within Savvy Teens, an awful lot of people say to me, oh, you know, I want to go and work in an area where there's going to be growing expectations as regards jobs of course right and that's that's so, so super simple now this is a piece that came out today i've just taken a screenshot here but let me go back there to the piece that i want to show you today which is here yeah okay so this is a piece that talks about planning for university your career prospects after college right so the piece goes on there all to talk about the future of where the workplace is going but what I wanted to do is I want to come particularly down to this bit, which is the screenshot I showed you. In the past five years, the number of renewables and environmental jobs in the US has increased by 237%. And we expect a similar boom in demand in Ireland. So this is coming from, let me go back up here. Uh, this is coming from somebody who is working. Sorry, she's not working. She's not just working in LinkedIn. Let me go back up here. Back, 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 back. Where is she? on? I saw her title up here earlier. Uh, Sharon McQueen, she's head of LinkedIn Ireland. LinkedIn is like Instagram for professionals, right? I've been on it for years. Lots of you will be on it in the future as well. Actually, there was one statistic that I wanted to share with you, which I will in a little while. Um, but so if I go down here, she says in the past five years, the number of renewables and environmental jobs in the US has increased by 237%. We expect a similar boom in demand in Ireland. Now, I see that all the time. We are running the TUI work experience next week for the Society of Actuaries. It's been widely promoted. Lots of you probably know about it already. We are running, so actuaries, that was the job that I wanted to go for when I started off going to Galway for financial maths and economics. Life took a different turn. I set up my own business instead and on from there. But I studied financial maths and economics with a view to becoming an actuary. And an actuary is somebody who looks at things like lifespans and life insurance, uh, well, assurance and premia and lots of things to do with, with insurance. Did you hear me say anything about the environment? No, but now it's a different story. We have a panel session alone next, next week focusing on sustainability and actuary because one of the biggest risks that is out there now for businesses and for individuals and life, etc., is climate change is that what if your assets get stranded? For example, what if a big pension fund buys assets in an environment that is at risk of being destroyed due to climate change? Look at the earthquake, for example, that happened um, a couple of weeks ago in Turkey. Um, so if you have that risk, well, then of course that creates a challenge, but and a whole load of other things, right? A whole load of other things. But my point is, is that there are very few companies now that I, that, that I, that I work with whereby they're not employing more people in sustainability or they haven't got someone dedicated towards sustainability or they haven't got new jobs involved in the environment. Um, Johnston Johnson is another company we do a lot of work with. And when I look at the wind turbine that they've created in Cork or anyway, I could go on and on. But my point is, is that there's huge growth in areas to do with, with renewables and environmental jobs. One other point, maybe, I don't know if you're aware of this, but I'm just gonna Google this, Wind Energy Ireland. I just wanna get the latest statistics here. Oh, because it is, mm, it's currently the biggest source. Yeah. It is the biggest source of energy. It is now, it, now wind energy creates a third of our electricity. Oh, sorry, now I didn't plan to bring this up, otherwise I'd have had it ready. But anyway, it's just wind energy is creating more and more of our, um, a third. Of, it's hitting records every month about the amount of energy generated in Ireland, specifically tying into electricity. So also, uh, McCooey says the five fastest growing green jobs between 2016 and 2021 were sustainability managers, wind turbine technicians, solar consultants, ecologists and environmental health and safety specialists. Also, demand for healthcare roles, they expect will persevere. And this is the interesting thing. 
is that despite the fact that the demand for the, those courses were down, now they were down in the areas we looked at, not dentistry, etc., but that they that is anticipated that they will be um, persevered upon. Since the pandemic, we've seen consistent high demand across essential services at the moment, uh, such as therapy, pharmacy and home care, particularly demand. So when trying to predict a prosperous, that means one where you can make a lot of money, career path, one thing to look for is currently pressing problems or developing areas. So environmental issues, socioeconomic development. OK, so that is like reducing inequality. These might be jobs in the UN or the European Union or also I well. Again, it's another area that, that we do a lot of work with in my own business is where we're helping uh, companies to connect in with young people on issues to do, for example, with financial literacy. And um, so two years ago, I published a book called Money Matters. It's in every school in Ireland. It was sponsored by CFA Society Ireland to help reduce financial literacy or sorry, increase financial literacy across the across the country, for example. It's just one of examples of, of the type of things that we do where we work with other organizations to connect in with young people. And of course, you all know the references to the sustainable development goals as well. A lot of companies are very focused on meeting those. Digital connectivity, I mean, that's just everywhere. That's just absolutely everywhere, whether it's helping companies to shape their TikTok, whether it is understanding how to maximize chat GPT, whether it is bringing teams together who've got remote working positions, whether it is enabling people to be able to continue to work in a hybrid way, whether on site some of the days or in their office some of the days and at home other days. And speaking of, trends indicate that demand for remote work will continue in office-based roles, which means that graduates may need to prepare to enter a new hybrid workforce and must be ready to adapt to that style of working from the outset. So for all of those reasons, I wanted to, to bring that up as that piece was just out in the Irish Times today. And that is an example of consumer expectations of the future. If you see that there is growing issues, particularly with the environment, socioeconomic issues, um, digital connectivity, health, uh, all those sorts of things, well, then that, of course, might also influence your decision. Now, what, I, what I'm not going to get into tonight is, is the declining roles as well, because there's also declining demand for a range of roles, a range of different careers, et cetera. And you can find those too. But I just wanted to show you a very recent piece in the Irish media today. OK, now, the, the last one that I'm going to go into in any sort of detail is this one. And this is government regulations. The reason I wanted to bring this up is, is it's this is the timetable, right, of how the CAO works. So you can only apply for the CAO on the 4th of November. And as you can see, it opened 12 o'clock. And then they're closed at uh, one o'clock or sorry, closed on the 1st of February. Right. So that's the normal closing date for applications. After that, the online um, opens and then there's the HPAT, which is what I mentioned, the undergraduate uh, entry to medicine. And then there's the closing date and all those sorts of things. But down here, here and there. Right. Let, let me just explain here and there. So there is um, referring to disability access. Right. So that is where the, the government government regulations here has enabled people who have got a specific disability, maybe it's dyslexia, maybe it's dyspraxia, um, maybe it's dyscalculia, um, maybe it's dysgraphia, maybe it's autism, maybe it's, so whatever it might be, if you've been assessed and, and granted the, um, the extra support in order to, uh, to take care of your, or to, to actually go ahead and do your leaving cert, well, or to help you do your leaving cert, this is something that the government wants to enable a leveling up. OK, so, for example, I have there's lots of people around me that have dyslexia, for example, and one of them, um, when he was doing his maths exam, he found it very difficult to read all of the story, let's say, that might have been in Project Maths. Uh, and then there was somebody who would read uh, on his behalf. Or uh, I've also had somebody else where. Uh, a cousin's daughter she found uh, she she had social anxiety and she couldn't um, be in a room where there was lots and lots of people when she was doing her exam and then they organized a separate room for her so things like now there are just two examples you could have a visual impairment an audio impairment I, you can imagine that there's a range of these in here but by putting dare in place it means then that people who have got and are dealing with a disability that then that they can then apply and apply for the support they need to be on a level ground with others. And then here is referring to higher education. 
access. So this I'm would sure. this would be for if people are are in a position where they couldn't afford to go to college, well, or also may come from a a, a disadvantaged economic background as well, um, is that then they can also get various support, some financial, but also some some supportive. And there's one of the companies that we work with. It's a legal firm. I won't name it, and I won't name the person. But she, we had a guest speaker in, in there one day and she came in to talk to us about, um, just for context, I run work experience programs for companies across the country. That's when I talk about the companies that I work with. But she came in to talk to our teenagers and what she said was that she got access into law through the HERE program. So she got extra points, but she got extra supports when she joined university and there was a financial support as well. And she said without HERE, she really would not have been able to go through the college and university experience in the same way that other people could. And she is doing phenomenal work now in that law firm. So that's also, of course, something that can affect the demand and just enable people to have, they can, um, through those, they can have more points or have, gain access to the income of points um, by uh, leveling up. Okay, so in summary, and I'm coming up right on time here. So again, if anybody does have any questions, I'm going to start opening my, my Instagram here now. And just seeing if anybody has, because of course, if you do, I need to be able to see it. So I'm just going to check that. Okay, yeah, so I'm just checking it here. And if there are any questions, as I say, please do pop them into the Instagram story, the chat or the question function. So back to functions is the demand function here. So in this case, as you can see, the demand function consists of the price of the good itself. So what I showed you there is the change in demand for courses based on where they're based, phys physically, location, where they're based, and that can also be driven by rent, um, the price of commuting, etc. And then there's the price of other goods. So this is as people are looking at where po points are going up and down, that's driven by how much demand there is for the courses. And as you can see there, we looked at level eight, we looked at level seven, six, we looked at mentions, we looked at first preferences as well. Then there's the income of the consumer. So there has been a change in the price of goods. Uh, sorry, not in the price of goods. There's been a change in leaving certain points over the years through great inflation. And in many ways, we can understand why that happened because uh, students went through a very stressful, and teachers went through a very stressful time over the past couple of years. And therefore, we have seen a change in the amount of income through points that the student who applied for this would have gotten. And as a result of that, then um, we've seen the amount of points that people have gotten has risen. And of course, then that has its own knock on effect. Consumers expectations concerning future prices. The comparison here is where are the fast growing areas coming from the point of view of jobs? And you can see there again, environmental jobs. Um, Jobs relating to a deep issue like inequality and socioeconomic issues, digital connectivity, remote working, etc. So consumer tastes or preferences, uh, I didn't want to necessarily talk about that because in the in my example here of my case study, um, consumer tastes and preferences can certainly be affected by expectations regarding the future. If we were simply talking about actual prices of a good, let's say a handbag, I might look at a handbag and say at the moment, it's really in season to have X. Whereas tomorrow we're expecting generally the price of handbags to rise, then we'd have two differences. But in this case, we are talking about consumer tastes and preferences in influencing the future price, namely the 0.7. Unplanned factors. I mean, you know, unplanned factors. Do I have to mention COVID here? That, of course, was an unplanned factor that happened two years ago. Um, there's a range of unplanned factors that I could talk about right now. And inflation, of course, is one of them that is going back up to the price of good itself. The Nobody was planning for the inflation rate that happened last year that was driven by a range of different things, including the war in Ukraine, which itself was an unplanned factor. Um, I could talk for ages about unplanned factors and how it ties into things like this. But again, we could we could talk for a while and that's not the purpose. You all know what an unplanned factor is. And then finally, the government regulation, that one, the specific government regulation that I'm referring to here is here and there. And of course, I could talk about the SUSE grants, I could talk about the cost of going to university, range of other things as well. But they were the two that I wanted to particularly pick up on as they appear in the CEO events calendar. OK, one last one then that I just want to show you is the Qualifax website. OK, because if it is the case, here we go, if it is the case that any of you do want to look into any specific course in more detail, 
And I just want to, of course, you can imagine that what I'm going to talk about are economics courses. This is the one to look at. So I'm just going to type in here economics and what type of courses are available. So we've home economics, economics and finance and Angel Street, economics, politics and law. And this is my one. Um, financial maths and economics. Oh, it's blocked. Oh, sorry, strange. Didn't expect that to happen. Right, I'm just going to try that again. Um, home financial maths and economics. Yeah, it's very strange. I don't know. I don't know how, how that has happened before. I'm just going to pop across here for a second. Financial maths and economics. Um, because I know everything about this course backwards. Financial maths and economics, NUI Galway. Well, what was NUI Galway? Um, Qualifax. Okay, let's see if this works. Yeah, there we go. Okay, this is what I was anticipating that we would find. So she, this is the course code. You don't type in onto your application form, financial maths and economics. It doesn't work like that. You you put in the course code. So as you can see here, it's GY309. It's a level eight. It's in, um, well, was National University of Ireland, is now University of Galway. Um, it is full-time. I would have to apply to the CAO. What I haven't talked about tonight is the PLC because... The public post leaving cert courses because it's not a career guidance session it is a case study of supply and demand that's the only reason i didn't four years here you can see there it's got a specific course subjects or course requirements so as you can see here you need a h5 or an 01 in maths the minimum grade of h5 in two subjects and passes in four subjects in each of irish english maths etc etc and also uh, the points awarded for lcvp mm. And if you're applying as a mature student, there you can see there here at the higher education access route, disability access route, etc. And this is the whole CAO point of view. Why choose this course? The course year by year, and you can go on there and see what else, um, what the subjects are involved in, the subjects that you might also like, career opportunities, and in here then you can see exactly uh, what has gone on to the, the type of jobs, the types of companies that they have gone on. I know a lot of people say actually in each of those companies. And then, and in particular, I would always say this, is that if you want to know more, reach out to the person in question, Keen to me taught me, and just reach out to the person there. As you can see, you've got the email address and their phone number, et cetera. And I remember being back in that, you know, that student, I think, I think I was settling on this course, let's say I was leaving Sartre start at a time, as opposed to, I researched, I researched actually, oh, I researched it up the wazoo in transition year for a transition year project. But I think it was, I think it was leaving start really when I settled on this one. And I remember ringing this number and talking to Keen Toomey, who ultimately was going to go on to be my lecturer and now is there. And I've actually gone back to be a speaker for financial maths and economics in, in Galway since. But that's an example of how to use the Qualifax website. So for any subjects that you might be interested in and looking into, that's where to go for the course requirements, uh, the contact details, the type of subjects that's actually in there, and then the, the course um, details thereafter. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, and I'm gonna pop back over here, check if there have been any questions, check if there has been any chats, and check if there have been any questions on Instagram. And it looks like, there haven't. Okay. Well, on that note, then, just as we're coming up to time, I'm just going to thank you very much indeed for being here with me. I hope this has been useful for you uh, on many levels. Like my point was tonight was to give you an insight into the CAO, show you some data analytics as well, and how you actually analyze data for those of you who are going through um, your preparation for the project. Um, bearing in mind, I know when the deadline is. So uh, just for anybody who is going to be either going through this as a recording or otherwise. And also to give you some live updates on um, a press release about the CAO and fast growing jobs in Ireland as well. So as always, my, my entire purpose uh, is to help you out in as many ways as I can. I did remember there was one last statistic. Sorry, I did remember there was one last statistic. Let me go back to that. It was on this one. Yeah, is 65%, 65%, just let me show you this one. 65% uh, of school leavers progress to higher education, one of the highest levels in Europe. And I think that is... Certainly a figure that's worthwhile referring to. Um, as, as you know, I will be putting the recording up on our, oh, our, yes. uh, I will be putting the recording up on our website. And in case you need any of my contact details, there you go. 
Um, I'm at on Instagram. I'm at Susan Hayes Culliton. On Twitter, I'm at Susan Hayes underscore. Um, but overall, as well, you can see there the positiveeconomist.com is our website, and you can register for our newsletter if you haven't already there on the um, on our website as well. So, as I say, on that note, thank you all so much indeed for being here with me. I do wish you the very best in all that you do. I will see you for another webinar again in a couple of weeks' time. You'll all be updated about that. But from me here, live from Dublin, uh, thank you all and good night. <laughs>